Hey listeners, we're nearing the end of our 15th anniversary fundraising campaign and we need your help to meet our goal. This campaign offers you a chance to win a unique food and music experience in one of the most exciting cities in America. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and you'll be entered to win dinner for two and two tickets to a concert in one of eight amazing cities. New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Ardmore, Pennsylvania, and Asheville. All donations support our work educating food system storytellers. And when you donate, you can choose one of those cities and you'll be entered to win dinner and two tickets to a show. So help us reach our goal and enter to win dinner and a show in the city of your choice. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. Today's program has been brought to you by Kane Vineyard and Winery, a Napa Valley winery committed to respecting the soil and dedicated to the creation of three Cabernet blends. For more information, visit Kane5.com. This is Chef Emily Peterson, host of Sharp and Hot. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network, broadcasting live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. If you like this program, visit heritageradionetwork.org for thousands more. Hello, and welcome to the Farm Report. I am your guest host for today, sitting in for Aaron Fairbanks. My name is Talia Ralph, um, and we are picking up this week in the third of a three-part series um, on the sheep and lamb industry. Um, Today, we are lucky enough to have in studio with us the co-producer of the series, John Wilkes. He's a U.S.-based livestock consultant, a writer, and speaker with um, a very extensive background on the U.K. as a U.K. sheep and beef farmer and producer. Um, So we're really glad to have you on with us today, John. Thank you. Um, And we're going to be speaking to two really great guests today. The first is uh, Jean-Pierre Garnier. He's the CEO of Eblex, the English lamb and beef executive. Thanks for being with us, Jean-Pierre. Of course, yes, we're here. So I will let the two Englishmen (laughs) go at it, or the Frenchmen (laughs) running the English lamb board, rather. Good evening. Good evening, Jean-Pierre. How are you? Good evening. Very good. Very Thank good. Nice to be on the on US radio. Indeed, it's a pleasure to have you here. It, the, the the irony of an Englishman in New York talking about American lamb to a Frenchman in charge of the English lamb and beef sort of exports isn't the it isn't wasted. You know the uh, spirit of entente cordiale. <laughs> yes, very much. So, yeah. yes. um, first of all, if you could just explain a little bit uh, to our listeners um, the purpose of Airblex, uh, just a very quick overview. I, I, of, I of think I think for for people we we. Uh, we paid uh, an organization to market and, and uh, lamb and beef uh, in the UK and uh, to export markets. And we, as I say, paid by farmers and processors. And as well, we help farmers to improve to their productivity and efficiency you know, in, in, their, in their production. That, that's through see, what you support, Signet, which is uh, sort of data gathering to help breeders and uh, producers. Yes, yeah, it's a small part of what we do. I think genetics is the basis of what we do, it'll be sheep or cattle or pigs, you know, and we need to have the right genetics to get the best possible product. That's... No, that's, uh, that, that's, that's admirable. That's really good. First of all, I know, I think I'm right in saying you've just come back from China. Yes, I think uh, I, I was for two weeks in China um, looking at what they're doing. Uh, it's an interesting country. It's the largest producer in the world of, of, of lamb and mutton. And it's absolutely massive industry. And uh, it is a very profitable industry out there. A lot of other processed products and good prices for farmers, for their own farmers. And uh, as well with China, a massive amount of investment taking place as, as we speak. Do you, do you see opportunities opening up there for, for UK lamb? Yeah, well, what's happening, if you're talking China by itself, it's a very interesting uh, situation where uh, most of the lamb is on natural pastures and there are limitations to what they can produce. As the market uh, increases, uh, they need imports, you know, to fill the gap. And they, uh, everybody is aware of that and government in, in a... It rarely has, uh, has appreciated that imports are there, are there to grow and there to stay. Yeah, I, I was looking at the figures, and the, the, the consumption of meat has risen from 1960 to 
uh, I think it was eight point eight pounds, and, yeah. and in two thousand and eleven, uh, it's one hundred and twenty-five pounds. I mean, I mean, uh, to be to be uh, to be it's a big big market. China, one point three four billion people, and uh, all eat three times more lamb per person than the, in the U.S. You know, which is quite 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 stunning. Wow. Yeah. Um, just just moving on then uh, in relation to the U.S. Seeing, seeing as we're we're over here and we're talking about the the U.S. market. Um, do, do you foresee the opportunity for uh, UK lamb to come into the United States in the near future, or is it very much uh, something that's going to be some way down the line? I think I think there is opportunities out there. The US market is absolutely huge, uh, uh, and it got totally um, very differentiated between uh, between very bulk product and uh, very low low prices and the premium end. Uh, where, where for food lovers and gourmets, that's what the, the end uh, we're aiming at, really. Yeah, I mean, lamb here is, uh, in essence, a rich man's meat. In, in many ways, it is sort of 40% more expensive than, than beef and chicken. And so I, I gather that the, 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 the Welsh sent out a, uh, should we say, a, a hunting party here in January to scout the market. Is that something that... Uh, you would be looking to do uh, through Ebelex to come out from the English yeah, side? Yeah, uh, absolutely. We, we, we got good contacts in the United States and we got good friends out there. Uh, there is a little gap for, for the type of product we can offer, which is slightly different than uh, New Zealand, Australia, and of course, uh, US lamb. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. The, the, I think that the, the, one of the issues I have here when I'm talking to uh, producers here is, is, this, is the random nature of production. The, it's a variable product. Um, could you explain a little bit how in the UK, how we seem to have um, uh, achieved some kind of uniformity? In, in, I, 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 I think we, we've got two advantages in the UK. The first thing is we've got a very well-established sector for centuries. And by, for the last decades, we told farmers exactly the kind of product we need which is an animal of 90 to 20 kilos, uh, very little fat and good muscle mass. So we got, if you want, we've got first communicated to farmers the, the right product. Second thing, the genetics is very important. We have many breeds in the UK, but uh, the, the main breeds, the main meat breeds, which are, uh, which are cross for the final, final article, are, are the Texel sheep, the Suffolk, and the Chevrolet, and uh, for the great, great majority of what we do. And finally, we get the climate. We get a very, very mild climate in the UK. Lots of rain. And uh, you need to an umbrella when you come to the UK, I'm afraid. <laughs> but it's lovely, and we get a lot of grass and a very mild climate all year round. So it allows us to produce uh, a consistent product all year round. Yeah, this is one of the issues, I think, um, which I think you're trying to address in the UK, is the kind of uh, the gap in the market that has traditionally appeared in the UK when uh, sort of... Uh, late spring we we have that uh, gap where the new zealanders have traditionally fil filled it I, is that something which you're working that, that, to that has changed to be fair this has changed we we have a different pattern of production that it would be would have been 20 or 30 years ago so you obviously we have a peak of production in the autumn but uh, we we produce uh, lamb all year round and, and people expect Lamb all year round. I mean, we got yeah. clients uh, in, in, not only in the UK but uh, in, in, in Europe and further afield who want the product all year round. It, it, would you would you agree it's the case that if you need to keep people eating lamb because they can soon forget about? I think in the States here. Ah, uh, yeah, absolutely, you're yeah, absolutely forget about correct. There, uh, uh, we need we need to keep uh, lamb at the forefront of consumer minds. So we have very strong consumer programs in the UK. Uh, we have consumer program in France, in Belgium, uh, in Holland nowadays, uh, and now even in Portugal, to make sure that people in, uh, keep eating lamb. Lamb is a very expensive uh, protein. The most, much more, as you already said, it's much more expensive than beef. So people love the flavor, but we make sure you know, it can be properly marketed, properly presented, for people now to cook it. Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done, and we've got a massive new project uh, which proposed to the European Union, which is going to uh, boost lamb consumption. Yeah, now I, I think that's a lesson that the, um, the that over here they could learn is is not to be frightened of imports because uh, you know they sustain demand, and um, because of course, as you know, over here they they're only uh, producing less than half of the lamb that's consumed. Yep, that's correct. So, so I mean, Im imports aren't really a threat. They are more uh, more sustain it. Um, I, I just wanted to ask you about um, the the introduction of the uh, electronic 
uh, evaluating systems which are going into slaughterhouses. Um, yep. Is that something which is will be across the board, or is it just in certain facilities? But it's acro- across Europe. Now we got electronic tagging, so the uh, the lamb got the electronic uh, tag. Uh, it's interesting to note that the sheep were the first one in Europe to to wear the electronic tag. It's advantages as well for going through market, for uh, identification, for traceability. Uh, even for weighing, automatic weighing of, of, of livestock and everything. So there's a huge amount of things we can we can do to automatize, you know, some of the processes with this electronic tag. Yeah. So it's only the beginning, only beginning of, of quite a revolution in, in our sector. And and is it is it, are you, is it being taken to the next level where actually within the slaughter facilities that, that the carcasses are actually being evaluated electronically? The actual finished carcass hanging up can be evaluated electronically. Uh, not yet, but uh, it is something because of transfer of data. Uh, obviously, the tag doesn't follow the animal, uh, the carcass uh, on the line, so the transfer of data. But uh, the, uh, for example, uh, an abattoir may be equipped, you know, for recognition to automatic reading of the tag and, uh, and for entering the data, and that's the kind of thing we, we can be done, you know. Yeah. Obviously, uh, obviously, once the, 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 the data is entered, you know you can you can re- relate back to farmers. Its performance at slaughter, you can uh, date back to farmers how healthy you know the animal was, you know after ins- uh, meat inspection. There are a lot of things we can do, you know, with, with electronic tagging. That's uh, you know that, that's a great thing. I actually saw one working when I was back in the UK. A, a guy it looked like he'd got a, a metal detector. He was walking through pens of lambs, and uh, it was kind of interesting to see the uh, all the tags getting registered electronically. Uh, j- just just looking at the over. I mean, you know, I'm asking you to put a different hat on. Um, if you were looking at the American industry, wh- what would be your uh, sort of take on it, and, and and what what would you say that they need over here to to push? Uh, lamb and sheep meat uh, and to open up the markets more I, I think the uh, I, I, I may be a bit I hope I'm not speaking out of turn and that would be too critical but we need we need to control cost of production you know in the UK we use grass grass is cheap you know yeah. uh, we don't use very little feed or hardly any feed uh, because that's expensive yeah. uh, and we don't tend to push too much the weight anyway we push the weight in view of uh, only on the genetics yeah. The genetics uh, improvement pushes the weight, not uh, not feeding a large amount of cereal, which is a very expensive way of doing so. That, that that's our view uh, of the U.S. the U.S. sector. That's, that, that's interesting. I, I, the, the weight thing here is an issue. I mean, I think average carcass weights went from about forty-five pounds in the U.S. went from forty-five pounds in the eighties, and it's, it's seventy-five pounds now. The average carcass weight, and uh, we we've got uh, Cody Hemke coming on shortly from from uh, Neiman Ranches, to, so it'll be interesting to hear his take on that. But uh, certainly, they, they do like them big over here. <laughs> and John Pierre, actually, if I could jump in, a question about. Um sort of creating consumer demand. You were mentioning a little bit earlier that you have these consumer programs. Could you go into a little bit about what those entail, sort of how you... Um well, we, we have a different, uh, different level of consumer program. I mean, we got generic consumer program, which we, we may involve uh, television advertising uh, around food shows on television. That, that's an example. Uh, we have uh, presences of shows with tastings, that, you know, at the general uh, consumer shows. Then we have uh, what we call trade developments that supporting the product with gastronomy, the gastronomy sector. And, and finally, we, we would be in supermarkets, you know, in many supermarkets, you know, promoting the product anyway. When people test the product, people test lamb, they know they, they, they like it and they want it, you know, and that's the key thing. It's uh, one of the best, the, the best thing for us to do is to, is to make people try the product. And a lot of people actually in the USA uh, never try the product, and it's, it's a bit of a shame. They're missing something absolutely great. For sure. Yeah, um, that, that rounds, rounds it up nicely. Um, I appreciate all your comments and uh, staying up late with the excitement of the, uh, of the Scottish question hanging over us all. <laughs> absolutely, yes. It's going to be an interesting situation tonight. Could, yes. how do, actually, just, that's, a, that's, that's a thought. How would that work then if they do to, to go for a, go for a, a, a yes for separation? Is, would would that affect um, the markets at all? For, for no, the, I, I, I wouldn't think so. I mean, the, in terms of the, the scheme of things, anyway, Scotland is a 
it's a large country, but it, it's not uh, in terms of livestock and farming. It's uh, it is not uh, a, a huge. Uh, it's not as big as uh, as it is. You know, uh, it's not people think. It's quite important in some area. Obviously, Scotch whiskey, fishing is very big because uh, you probably heard that. Uh, Scotland got 20% of fish stocks in, in Europe. That's big in, in, in fishing. Importance in, uh, in potato seeds and some of some of areas. But overall, we don't expect uh, too much uh, too much difficulty to and, forward. And yet, ultimate, and ultimately, the, the the Scots provide us with one of the most gastronomically challenging dishes: the the haggis, which is a sheep stomach. So it's. <laughs> Yeah, they, as I say, have you ever tried that? Well, I mean, we're coming back to sheep anyway. And it's, yeah. uh, well, it's, uh, we were we were drum, we drum of whiskey, as we said. And yeah, it's perfectly, perfectly palatable. You know? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Great. Well, Jean Pierre, we're actually going to uh, head to a break, but thank you so much for being on with us. And My for pleasure. Those of you listening, that was Jean Pierre Garnier, the CEO of thank you, Jean Publex, and we'll be back in just a minute. You're listening to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network. <laughs> And wrapped in every tree's toes curled under Or light by smoke-cold amber gray Dissolved to travel careless lost forever Forgotten in the earth's eternal slumber A story told beneath the trees Pronounced in every rattle creek and This is Chris Howell from Cane Vineyard and Winery, calling in from Spring Mountain above the Napa Valley. Thank you for listening to this show. In our industrial world of highly processed food and wine, we support the values of Heritage Radio Network. All of us at Cane encourage you to seek out individuality and beauty in everything you eat and drink. To learn more about us, go to Cane5.com.
This is Brandon Hoy, co-owner of Roberta's, and you're listening to HeritageRadioNetwork.org. Hello, and welcome back to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network. I'm your guest host for today, sitting in for Aaron Fairbanks. My name is Talia Ralph. We're here with John Wilkes, who is a sheep expert, writer, former farmer, now based in the U.S., formerly in the U.K., um, and we are pleased to have in this sev- second segment with us um, Cody Hemke, who is a lamb buyer with Neiman Ranch. Cody, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Great. So John is on the line, too. Cody. Good. John, good, good. talk to you. Good <laughs> afternoon. Yeah, we've been in, communi- in communication otherwise. Yeah, you... you um, you come to us as, as, a, as a sheep man. Uh, I can see from your bio, you, you know, you, you've got a BS and an MS from the University of Wisconsin, and you, you're involved with uh, Neiman Ranches, but you're also, very importantly, a breeder of Shropshire sheep, which, ironically, is the county where I farmed back in the UK, which is kind of interesting. Um, yeah, in a beautiful county at that. Well, you may, and you've been there, of course. So you know, I haven't got a. Con- you know, I'm preaching to the converted here, obviously. So, <laughs> so there you go. Yeah, because when when I saw that your your flock was named the the Mableton Mind, and I that got my sort of interest going because that's a big hill near where I live. So anyway, another mm-hmm. story. Um, the, the the Neiman thing is is the day job, presumably, um, but you are involved variously on the American Lamb Board, the uh, NSIP, the National Sheep Improvement Program, um, and all sorts of other stuff. So perhaps you could uh, tell us a little bit about uh, uh, Neiman Ranches and 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 exactly what what your roles are role is there. Yeah, first, uh, and this happens often. The first thing I'll need to do is correct. Correct pronunciation. It's actually Nyman. Okay, um, I'll just whack non- my hand. <laughs> <laughs> Nyman. Okay. So it, it happens often. I always figure if I don't if I don't tell people how to pronounce it, they won't know. So it is Nyman. Um, Severe apologies. Yeah, I've I've, I've managed uh, the Nyman Ranch Land Program since 2005. Um, that fall, I started managing at night. I do everything from front to back. I contract with the growers um, you know, to make sure that we've got our year-round supply of seasonally fresh uh, and young lamb, and I work with uh, the packing plant to make sure that they're making all the cuts we need. I set a lot of the pricing, and occasionally I, I help sales with just some of my random sheep knowledge and the knowledge of our program, helping them to place their product. Uh-huh. And, and what, what, how many lambs a year are you, are you putting, through, putting through the plant? We'll do about, we average about 150 lambs a week, so eight to 10,000 lambs a year. Right. And uh, you actually have a, um, a grid system, I believe, that, yeah. that, that, where, whereby you are actually paying a premium for the lambs that you need and you know you can sell. Yep. So, and that's, you know, our, our program is a little different than a lot of the lamb we find out there. I mean, we, we don't work with a lot of producers. We work with you know, some pretty... The medium-sized producers for out west, uh, certainly for the Midwest where I live, they'd be large producers. Um, but we, um, you know, it's an antibiotic-free, hormone-free program. All the lambs are born and raised on the same ranch, and you know, with that, there's some added costs. Um, so we have a lot of conversations with the producers as far as production costs, making sure we're offering uh, an appropriate premium uh-huh. um, uh, for, for what they need. And, and the big thing that we do is we, we pay on a grid, and that grid is basically it's a signal to the producers to tell them how big of a lamb we want when they harvest right. and how much how much finish is on that lamb, how much fat um, they have on that lamb. We want a little bit, not too much. Right. And I think we've got a, a very good track record of our producers adapting to that grid. And, you know, they we, I, I tell people that whenever I want to grow the program or if I need to bring a new producer in, actually work with our producers to say, all right, which of your neighboring farms or who, who should be we, we be working with? Because they're, they're still vested into the, the program. We want to make sure they bring somebody else good in. I see. That, that, that sounds admirable. Um, we had um, Jean-Pierre Garnier on uh, previously, and we were talking about carcass size, and he, you know, he had a few, a few thoughts on it. Uh, I, I, I gather you aren't going for that bigger carcass. I mean, you're in that sort of, what, 60 to 70, not, not much bigger. It, would that be fair, or, or, or do you take heavier weights? Uh, you know, that's, that's, I, yeah, I, I, that's fair. I'd say we're, we average about a 67-pound carcass. Um, and you know a lot of what we do, we, we don't 
we don't tout any specific breeds or crossbreeds in our program. And, you know, there's going to be some larger frame sheep and some smaller frame sheep. So the grid is flexible enough to work for them. Uh, the big thing is having, um, you know, if I've got a smaller 55-pound lamb, I want to make sure I've got the muscling in there. Um, you know, it's going to be equivalent to a 70-pound lamb. Right. We have that. And the big thing is making sure they have that specific finish we're looking for. And are you finding that um, the, the work of the NSIP, the National Sheep Improvement Program, are basically, is American lamb improving in, in conformation and, uh, and shape? Are, are you getting more meat on, on carcasses? I think the, the, we're a little early to say that. Uh, NSIP is doing a lot of good things recently. Um, we, I did just finish listening to a program from last week, which was very good. Um, and I, one thing that I didn't catch if it came up, but we just transitioned to kind of a new system uh, about four years ago. And there's, we still are working on a little bit more uptake, uh, both with the, the breeder side of things, those that are producing the seed stock or the rams that go into commercial flocks, yeah. um, and working with those commercial producers to buy. So we're not... We're not seeing as much in the industry yet. We have a lot more work to do on that. Right. Um, but the science is sound. The data is sound. Um, you, know, I, you mentioned the MS. I, I'm not sure if we covered this when you and I had have met previously that my, my MS work was actually using ultrasound similar to a lot of what you did. So, uh-huh. uh huh. In another life, I, I did use. I think you were looking at. Look, you were using it to measure meat, and I was using it to measure the camp fetus inside sheep. So right. we're, we're ultrasound, ultrasound um, fans. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in, in, if there is such a thing. D- moving on, um, I, t- I met you first at the American Sheep Industry Association shindig in Charleston this year, early on, the, 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 the big event, and uh, hugely interesting for me, the first time I'd been. It was, of course, the launch pad for the Lamb Industry Roadmap, which is, uh, I think, you, you, you'll agree, a, a highly significant uh, document. Um, I wonder if you could explain a little bit about the Lamb Industry Roadmap and, and the huge significance it has for the American Lamb Industry. Sure, I... Actually, had a conference call on it this morning, um, which there's been a lot of conference calls on it, and, and it's actually a result of um, in, in the last four years we've seen a lot of fluctuation, a lot of volatility in the lamb market, um, both from a price standpoint and from a size and some different you know product oriented, quality oriented standpoints. We've seen a lot of fluctuation and. We've, you know, historically seen the sheep numbers in the United States declining quite a bit, and there was a basically the the the, the impetus for it was a letter that the California wool growers had written to ASI, and you know, they ASI and the Land Board have worked together to address that question of, you know, how, how do we why are we seeing all these this volatility, and you know, more importantly, what do we do to fix it? So it's. And we've seen some a little bit of volatility since then. Um, we've got a lot of really good people within the industry working on this. Right. Um, and we again here we have more work to do. Okay. Uh, just sort of uh, getting away from that um, and onto the um, the direct marketing, which is something which interests me, um, particularly on up the eastern side of the country. That there are several producers. We we had Keith Martin on from Purebred Lamb in the first program. Um, some very in- innovative and entrepreneurial um, producers who are creating a, a very good product, which they're getting a premium for. I- is that something you can see expanding the these uh, sort of smaller scale producers? Uh, definitely, I think that within the industry, and one of the gentlemen that's on the roadmap too, out of Indiana, he's mentioned that you know here in the Midwest and out east, um, there's. A lot of demand for the direct marketed lamb. A lot of those producers have problems filling orders year round because right. of the large demand. Um, you know, it's, it's two very different. I think when you look at you know, population densities um, and the lamb consuming public, uh, you here in the Midwest or at least east of the Mississippi, uh, you, you find a lot more people out there willing that are easier to direct to, to connect with and direct market. So, and on, on the on the sort of growing market side of things, the the halal market is 
uh, I would imagine something which is is uh, growing rapidly here, given the number of people coming here from countries where uh, they eat a lot more lamb, and uh, it's it's got to be uh, killed to meet their criteria. Uh, again, would you have any view on that? I mean, is that are you seeing that in? I mean, you're on the sharp end. Are you seeing more more growth in the uh, halal market? I, I think uh, we're, we're definitely seeing growth in it. I, I'm not personally involved with that. Um, you know, I do a lot of the Nyman Ranch lamb. Um, and frankly, a lot of lamb, a lot of the larger volume produced lamb is uh, harvested in the halal manner. Um, just actually, just in the last few years, uh, you know, I, I, since I serve on the land board, we've been looking a little bit more at, you know, for lack of a better term, we'll call ethnic promotion. And um, you know, it's, it's definitely been a new focus where we're trying to make sure that we're we're marketing to and connecting with. Um, you know, I'd say populations that the land board traditionally hasn't worked with. Yeah, but it's a new focus for us, and definitely something that we're aware um, is is a, is a good opportunity. Yeah, no, that, that that that's great. Um, well, one of the things that I, I kind of got confused with that not confused, but I found interesting at the event was that there was a big call amongst uh, the various people on the committees of the American Sheep Industry Association to to, to open up exports for um, American lamb. I mean, now, now, mm -hmm. now, uh, now, given that you're only sort of 45, 50% self-sufficient, isn't there a big enough market here to take all you can produce, or do you need to open up other markets? I, you know, I, I've got to credit a friend of mine um, who works for a fellow lamb company because I, I questioned it as well right. at one point. Um, but he explained it to me in, in terms that made a lot of sense. It was a, a point in time when the industry was pretty long on lamb racks, yep. a lot in the freezer. Uh -huh. And in order to move those domestically, uh, the price would have had to drop significantly or it would have affected the entire cutout on the non-frozen lamb racks well and a, a, a big value in opening up different export markets is being able to diversify some of those items that you're long on without eroding uh your market domestically yeah. uh that explains it very quickly now we're coming on to an exciting topic which you and i both are really into at the moment and that's mutton and and uh, you, you've been ex uh, if we move away to your sort of to your uh, other life or your with the, your own flock you you've been uh, experimenting with mutton to some degree of success I see on Facebook um, creating some wonderful salamis and uh, sausages from mutton um, how's it going down literally <laughs> really well um, there's a little bit of spice in some of them that is frankly not needed I. You know, I, I go back to some of the meetings we've had in, in the land board and that, and I, and I think I, I made a post once on Facebook saying that mutton doesn't need to be a dirty word. Um, you know, if we look at historically, um, you know, a lot of sheep producers like to blame World War II and yeah. people eating mutton, and, you know, therefore you have generations now that don't eat mutton, and that was quite a while ago. Um, and, you know, I wasn't sure. This was the first time I had actually taken any... Um, Spent use, call use, and decided to processing on anything on them. And uh, you know, I was prepared for maybe a stronger and more intense flavor, which I didn't get. Um, and the products we made have been really good. There is, I, I work with a group out of Madison called the Underground Butcher, uh -huh. and they put together some really nice uh, one one very traditional type salami, one in Buya, which is a very spicy and spreadable salami. Um, they made at your suggestion some bill tong, which was fantastic. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been going very well. I've also got a couple hundred pounds of just different fresh sausages in the freezer that have worked well too. That's good. It, it, well, it's it's a great way to make uh, profit from what is in essence a, a byproduct. The the old ewe, the older animal, is is a sort of a, it, it hasn't got any sort of great lamb value. But if it can be turned into something like that, then it's it's going to add value for producers. Um, yeah, absolutely. No. And something, if you don't mind if I could add, I mean, something that on the national scene we've been talking about is if there's more value for those yeah. those older ewes, people will be more apt to move them and actually keep a more productive flock well, as well. Well, you're, you're in very good company. There's a new book just been published in the UK by an old mate of mine, uh, Bob Kennard, uh, called mm -hmm. Much, Much Ado About Mutton. 
and with a foreword by H.R.H. Prince Charles, who is a mutton fanatic. So, uh, I, you know, I think uh, mutton seems to be having a bit of a renaissance um, both sides of, of the water, which is good. It, it's a great product. Um, mm-hmm. And so I think we've had a great conversation. I would just like to ask you quickly about your thoughts on wool and the, 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 just if you could encapsulate very quickly where the American wool industry is currently and, you know, is, is it going to improve? Yeah, you know, I, as, as we kind of talked early on, I'm not a big wool expert by any means, but I, you know, I, I do know there has been a lot of work. You know, ASI did a lot of lobbying to bring a superwash system to the United States, and for anybody unaware of what superwash is, um, it's a process that actually makes wool washable, and um, it, it, it's a close to skin technology where the wool doesn't get itchy when you wear it. Yeah. Um, previously, American wool had to go to China to go through that process, and it would, I believe it went to France to be dyed. Now we can do a lot of that stuff domestically. Um, you know, there's a lot of exciting stuff going on with that. Um, and there's a, a new line of uh, domestically produced close-to-skin wool products that's coming out very shortly here. Um, you know, I think for, for a lot of those bigger flocks out west, there's a lot of opportunities. And you know, even two weeks ago here in in Wisconsin at our sheep and wool festival and we got three barns full of people selling selling yarn and roving and all kinds of stuff that it's it's definitely become much more in vogue than it had been I'd say in the last ten years and there's a lot of good potential for it. That's that's really good. Well, uh, I have so enjoyed having you on and thank you so much for, for coming on and uh, helping to inform us about the situation over here. Um, Thanks I'll for being on. Pass you on to tell you now just to say goodbye and uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for thank shedding, very much. shedding some light on the American side of things, Cody. It was great to have you. Absolutely, anytime. Thank you much. Hey. Um, well, we're just wrapping up, but before we do, um, just sort of to en- encapsulate the series, this has been a, a three part um, series on various aspects of the sheep industry. And, John, for you, what do you think some of the big takeaways are? I think um, talking to Jean-Pierre today in, in that the industry here, um, there needs to be some kind of uniformity to it, to, to the product, and so that people, when people know they pay a lot of money for a piece of meat, they know they're going to get the same quality that, that if you are in Costco and you buy 10 chops from Australia, you know that they are going to be like little peas in a pod, they're going to be good quality. And, and I think that's the biggest issue I see is trying to establish um, protocols and improving breeds and uh, as, as Cody intimated trying to get animals with, with a higher meat content um, to um, encourage people to eat lamb for sure and do you think um, aside from that the biggest challenge is, especially in the states is getting people to have a taste for it or are there other hurdles no, I, to create? I, I think culturally um, I, I know Cody, we, Cody and I we talked about this but A lot of servicemen, as I've said before, servicemen were serving away and overseas historically, and they got canned mutton, which I would imagine isn't particularly fun. You come back, and then you you don't eat it. Therefore, your kids don't eat it, and you lose a generation. And and it Mm -hmm. it can be potentially more gamey. Uh, than than would appeal to American tastes and the beef and the chicken industry latched onto that at, at back in the time and forged ahead and lamb sort of receded so but I'm encouraged by um, the amount of people that are now eating lamb and with the greater ethnicity so many people coming here from the Middle East and from Europe and from Central America you know are, are eating lamb so I think it's on the way back, and when you've got great folk like Cody, who are so passionate and uh, about promoting the industry and the the good the goodness in lamb, you know, high in omega three, it's healthy, it's good for you, it's a natural product. I, I think there's a great future. For sure. Well, John, thank you so much for for co-producing this series. I My know pleasure. Aaron really appreciated it as well. Um, Thank you guys for listening. This has been another episode of The Farm Report. Aaron Fairbanks will be back next week with more. Um, In the meantime, this is Heritage Radio Network. I'm your host, Talia Ralph, and we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for listening to this program on heritageradionetwork.org. You can find all of our archive programs on our website or as podcasts in the iTunes store. 
by searching Heritage Radio Network. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Heritage underscore radio. You can email us questions anytime at info at heritageradionetwork.org. Heritage Radio Network is a 501c3 non-profit. To donate and become a member, visit our website today. Thanks for listening. I want to tell you about a new podcast called Amuse News. Publishing multiple days a week, Amuse News is your source for food news, interviews from around the food world, and more. On the show, we'll be engaging with food storytellers, from chefs to advocates to people working in the field, and many more. Find Amuse News wherever you get your podcasts. Amuse News is a destination for everyone who's looking for a new, insightful look into the world of food.